The hymn that we just sung is a hymn about the baptism that our Lord went through. Now, we often think of baptism as being in the font, and Jesus' baptism as being in the Jordan. But in the Gospel of Mark, what's brought forward for us is the reality that what Jesus was baptized into, and for the purpose of his baptism, was this very moment was his taking the throne, was his crucifixion, his being crowned with thorns. And this is what Jesus says to James, the one we remember today, and his brother. You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, to be able to, ba to be baptized with a baptism with which I am baptized. And they boldly proclaimed, the two of them, we are able. And he told them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. We often think about an enthronement as being on a throne. The one who is seated there as king wears the crown, and he's given a scepter. In the case of King Charles, he was given that strange globe with the cross on the top of it, the one that Monty Python called the holy hand grenade. I don't know what it is. It represents something. But when Charles was granted the throne at the ceremony, though at his mother's death, he was, was already king. Well, that's what we imagine. And that's the glory that James and John were looking for. Now Mark, bearing, uh, Mark giving forth the witness of Peter here, I think Peter is being generous in telling Mark all about what happened. Matthew, not so much. For it wasn't necessarily just James and John speaking. They did ask him, but according to Matthew, they asked through someone else. And Jesus responds to them, knowing that their motivation, it's them who is asking, not mom. Because that's who came forth. These sons of thunder, these ones who wanted to be great, these ones who boldly proclaimed Jesus and the kingdom of God. And Jesus called them the sons of thunder because of their bold preaching. As if they were calling down lightning from heaven. Because thunder comes after lightning. These two who would be great and who were such bold preachers needed bigger guns to come and ask Jesus. So they ask their dear mother, Mom, Jesus is, is Jesus going to make Peter more important than us? So they try to get Mom, who knows Jesus likely very well, to get Jesus to, to give them the two most important seats in the kingdom. Or to sit at the right and the left of the king would be, to be, would be to, to be the most valuable of advisors. It would be to share in that glory, the lesser. That's what they wanted. It was their pride and their vanity. 
their carnal flesh that desired glory. And they will receive it, but not according to the pattern of this world. And that's what Jesus told them. You will drink the cup that I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. Who is it that is crowned? And Jesus comes into his glory. Who are those that sit at his right and his left? The people whose minds are on carnal things, matters of the world, the very last thing that we would think about is Jesus' crucifixion. But that's what he's talking about. He's talking about when he comes into his glory. For the glory of the Son of God is to glorify his Father by doing his will. In fulfilling his will, he glorifies his Father, and his Father glorifies him. The moment when the kingdom of God comes in, in its fullness to this earth first happened when Jesus was crucified and he fulfilled the, the, he fulfilled the will of God to die for the sins of the whole world. And to whom was it granted to sit at his right and his left when he came into his kingdom? Two robbers, two criminals, two sinners. Both of them mock Jesus. Only one of them repents. To one, we know the end result. That he will face the judgment on the last day. But the other heard the sweet gospel that came forth from, from Jesus. Before he died, he told them, and that thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But Jesus is coming into his kingdom. So his prayer is answered. I tell you, today you shall be with me in paradise. He believed in Christ. And there are those who will argue, well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized, so you don't have to be baptized. You just have to believe. Nonsense. You don't know if he wasn't baptized or not. He very well could have been baptized by John in the Jordan and relapsed, fell into sin again. And there on the cross, before his Savior repents of his sin, before his own death, and is baptized with the baptism that Jesus is baptized with. To bear the cross. And he did. John was a martyr in will, but not in deed. The younger son of thunder would suffer terribly. And he would witness to his faith would suffer terrible things at the hands of the Romans, but he would not die for his faith. He would die a saint's death, but not for the sake of his faith. He would be the last of the apostles still walking this earth. His elder brother, James, would be the first of that apostolic band to go to glory. Both of them suffering, as Jesus said they would, for their faith. Neither of them suffering death by crucifixion, but certainly dying for their confession of who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and what he did. In the time of Claudius, the Roman emperor, Herod the Great, or not Herod the Great, but Herod, one of the descendants of Herod the Great, in order to please the Jews, because he was a politician, he arrested those who were following Jesus. And who
who better to arrest than two of the apostles? James is arrested and he is beheaded. He loses his head for his confession, for what was in his heart, for what he preached with his lips and what he proclaimed. Peter, not yet, later on. On the moment, at the moment of James's death, he received the reward that was promised to him to sit on a throne, not in this world, but in the next. As one of the 12 apostles, as one of the first who would teach and preach concerning Jesus. And it is through their witness, through their lives and their words, that men and women in this life came to faith themselves. And it is their words that continue to be preached, their words that are words that are weighty, their words that are bloody, their words that continue to preach Christ and his death and resurrection. We in the church who preach and who would be great must always remember that the calling to, to be one who will preach and teach is the calling to be a servant, not to seek the vain glory of this world, and not to turn the church into some kind of worldly institution whose only goal is to maintain itself. But to see the church for what it is, a place where the gospel is proclaimed, where faith is granted, where faith is renewed, where sins are forgiven, where the commands of Christ to baptize are fulfilled, where disciples are made, and when the Lord's Supper is celebrated, and where people love one another as they show forth their faith in lives of love, and therefore showing forth their love for God and for all who take up the cross, take up the cross knowing that this life is not to offer the church glory. This life this church is all about the life to come, preparing people for that moment. And so we are to dedicate ourselves in lives of service to one another as we proclaim and as we hear and as we share and invite others to come into this life of love, life of hope, and a life of faith as we follow our Lord what he has promised to all of us, that one day, when we leave this life, we shall be with him in glory and receive the reward he won for us when he suffered and died, when he was crowned, and when the kingdom came. So let us rejoice this day in remembering James, remembering his witness, and praying that that witness we strengthen our own so that we can share what Christ has done for us as well. Amen.